Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to begin as people pull up. And I would like to say thank you to everyone who's here, especially to David and Daniel. Sorry, my dogs are definitely going to go <laughs> crazy. Um, this is the second in our series of talks for Foot Island Festival this year. Um, I'm going to introduce the speakers briefly and then we'll continue. So David Hunt, um, he started his career as a corporate banker, but has since worked in crop and livestock agriculture as a managing director and founder. He's a faculty member of Singularity University. He has provided consultancy uh, for the Advanced Research Project Agency of the United States Department of Energy. Um, he works on sustainable agriculture and uh, on agricultural legislation and entrepreneurship. He's an active ag tech investor and acts as a board member and advisor to many leading ag tech startups. And Daniel Salai is a Hungarian visual artist whose work investigates peculiar manifestations of human animal relationships and reflects on ecological, societal, political and economic anomalies. Uh, Daniel studied photography at the Moholy Naj University and the University of Applied Arts in Vienna. And he holds a degree in art and design theory. Uh, Daniel's latest project, Unleash Your Herd's Potential, is currently exhibited at Rathfarnham Castle in Dublin as part of the Photo Ireland Festival's main group show, Bite the Hand That Feeds You, and it's there until the 2nd of August. The project renders cows and their environment using photogrammetry, reflecting on surveillance and the influence of technology on our relationship to nature. Considering precision livestock farming, the project takes cattle as an animal broken to the algorithm and thus reflects on surveillance, exploitation and our relationship to nature. And the complexities of the human animal relationship and the role of technology within is of course a really huge and immensely complex topic. And we have two really interesting speakers to share their thoughts with us today. So please feel free to pop your questions, thoughts and comments into the chat or the Q&A box and we can share them later. Uh, I would like to make everyone aware that the conversation is being recorded and it may be shared publicly at a later date. So uh, I'd like to begin um, somewhat at the beginning and ask both of you how this all started. Um, Daniel, maybe we can start with you. Um, the topic of human-animal relations is something that e has been prevalent in your uh, work, but I'd like to know how specifically you came across looking into this technology for this project. And then following that, David, if you have, um, well, you have a very interesting and active background. Um, I understand it's from agriculture, it's an agricultural one. So perhaps um, after Daniel, you could briefly just tell us how you came into working in digitizing agriculture. And then I'm curious how Daniel and David, how you both came to get to know each other. All right. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for, for having me. I'm really glad to be here. And I'm, I really appreciate David accepting this uh, invitation to this talk. Because, uh, uh, yeah, I think we talked last uh, autumn sometime and uh, the conversation was really insightful and uh, yeah I'm really looking forward to this conversation to, to follow today. Um, yeah I've been working with human animal relationships um, in, an art, in my artistic practice since five years now almost. Uh, I started with different animals, uh, chickens, pigeons, uh, you name it and uh, yeah I came across a very interesting article uh, in 2018 about um, the uh, implementation of facial recognition uh, programs in different farmings. Um, it was first uh, mentioning uh, salmon uh, farming, actually, but then it also mentioned um, the, uh, the uh, use of, uh, of this algorithm in uh, cattle farming. And I was very much interested in that because uh, actually it was uh, at the very same time when um, when there was a lot of debate about China implementing this huge, uh, massive uh, serving system, uh, which of course, most of the Western societies were quite outrageous about, um, which I found quite interesting. Of course, first of all, it sounds truly crazy to have this omnipresent, fully uh, working um, serving system. But at the same time, I felt that there's quite an interesting political debate about it uh, and it's being demonized in a way uh, as if we wouldn't give away all our personal information um, just by ourselves using uh, Facebook, Instagram whatsoever. Uh, and it, it was special to China to, to um, implement surveillance in human society. 
but so of course, uh, because of my background, I became very much interested in this topic and I wanted to, to figure out. And it was also at the same time when, um, when Shoshana Tsukov, uh, quite interesting work, uh, Servants Capitalism uh, appeared and I thought, wow, okay, based on my previous project uh, um, where, in which I dealt with uh, how um, we implement um, ideas of social constructions uh, into the uh, animal uh, world as a kind of test somehow to what we would actually be happy to see in our societies uh, uh, being, uh, being used. Uh, I thought it would be quite an interesting thing to, to look at it. And uh, then I started to work on it uh, more actively a year ago, something like that. Um, and this is also when I came, of course, uh, of course, uh, when I get to uh, get the chance to, to meet David. Um, yeah, that's the story behind the, the project. <laughs> And great, thank you. And uh, this um, technology, I suppose it's, well, maybe I'll ask David first, actually, um, how you came about into working in digitizing agriculture. Um, I know you have like a very active background and I, I, I don't want you to go you know, all the way, <laughs> but just how you sort of went from going into banking and then into uh, agriculture. Um, yeah. Yeah, so the, the answer to the first part of that is incredibly simple. Uh, I went into banking because I didn't know what I wanted to do it myself, and I felt I should be well paid while I worked it out. Uh, so that's why I went into banking. Um, didn't enjoy it, didn't like it, did it for five years, was well paid. Uh, and <laughs> so um, at that point, I, I, I quit banking, and um, a relatively famous agricultural person called uh, Pierce Lyons, who's uh, deceased now, sadly, he brought me over to show me everything his company, uh, Alltech, were doing. Um, and Alltech were doing some fascinating things re relative to technology and feed additives for animals. Basically, they had products where if you fed them to animals, they had a better immune system, so you needed to use less antibiotics, they put on weight better, these sort of things. But they were interested in technology in general. And I got exposed to their annual conference and I realized, wow, well, this is about 2012, and I, or sorry, 2010. And I realized, wow, uh, our uh, agriculture is on the cusp of it, its next major revolution in human history. And what's most interesting about this one is this is the first agricultural in, in human a revolution in human history that is not based on stopping starvation. All previous agricultural revolutions have been staving off uh, exponential population leaving, leading to starvation related issues. This current revolution we're going through, this is all about, we know we can feed 10 billion people today quite easily. The problem we're trying to solve with this agricultural revolution is how do we kill, kill, sorry, feed 10 billion people without killing the planet in the process of doing so. Um, and the fact that it was being driven by this agricultural revolution was chiefly being driven by technology, mostly software, hopefully very soon more sort of farm robots. I could just see a lot of my personal loves, love, loves in life coalescing into a singular area. And I just felt that, you know, whether I make a difference in this industry or otherwise, it's going to be fascinating to be a bystander on what will be an inflection point in human history, uh, good or bad. So, so that's what caused me to leave finance and, and go into agriculture. And then how I got into Cainthus. So I was running Ireland's largest grain trading company. And it was a global logistics business. So like I'd be buying grain in Argentina and shipping it to Ireland to make beer and stuff like that and animal feed. And uh, basically I came to realize that most of the big problems in global agriculture weren't actually properly measured. And we didn't actually know what was good, bad or indifferent in agriculture because we didn't measure anything at commercial field level. And, you know, I was sitting here where people were trying to make big decisions about the future of food. And I was like, hang on a minute, you're making big multi-decade decisions about the future of food in an almost complete absence of measurement. So without the baseline measurement, we can't actually tell what's good or bad. So then I went to that Singularity University place that I'm now on the faculty of, and I realized that um, 
imaging sensors and graphical processing units were improving in quality while declining in cost at an almost exponential rate. And if you did some prohibitively expensive upfront software development, you could turn cameras into a universal measurement device that a farmer could use and improve their operations and in a superior fashion versus the cost of getting the information to do so. So I was like, right, cameras can bring cheap digital measurement to farmers and building a business around that is going to be step one in doing a proper data-driven agricultural transformation that will enable us to provide food for 10 billion people in a sustainable fashion. So that, that was the seed idea that became Canthus. And we actually started in crops and we moved to cows because first of all, computer vision doesn't like variability. So if you're outdoors exposed to all sorts of different sunlight, uh, that you, that's much harder to develop computer vision tools around that. Uh, so doing indoors in dairies, you had a more controlled environment. Uh, and it was actually my brother's idea to move to cows. He read an article about uh, computer vision technologies being applied to human athletes. And he was sort of like, hang on a minute, could we do this with cows? And one of our co-founders, who was our technical co-founder, Robin, um, his father was one of the leading dairy nutritionists in North America, and he knew a lot about cows. So about a month after my brother had that suggestion, Robin had knocked up a, t a, a prototype where we were able to identify, track and follow an individual cow. And over time, we started building up additional functionality around that until we were able to start delivering commercial products. Uh, so today we're selling commercially on dairies with a thousand cows plus in North America. And again, one of the reasons we moved into cows is cows had the best unit economics in pretty much any agricultural area. And it also had the highest rate of technology adoption versus other areas of, uh, of agriculture. So we were like, right, the farmers can afford to pay more money here. It's easier for us to apply the technology. And the application of this technology to this space can do a lot to improve productivity, sustainability, and cow welfare. So like, the, for example, the product we released October, we're the first company in the world that does uh, that can give you a cow comfort index to tell you how comfortable or otherwise your cows are in a particular environment. And uh, how does the technology actually work? Because um, if, if you were to look it up, a, a lot of places mention facial recognition, but that's not what it actually is, right? So my, my CTO, I, and, and the minute you said facial recognition, I just got a mental flash of my CTO, Jane, cringing in horror at that term being used as to what we do. And that's a term that we've something got, we've somewhat gotten stuck with. So what we're doing is like pixel pattern recognition. And we identify, like we annotate pixels and say this collection of pixels is what we call a cow. And we feed thousands and thousands of those into, and I'm, I'm way oversimplifying things to the point that again, I'm offending Jane while I'm saying this, but it, it makes it'll, it's easier to explain this way. So we feed thousands of those images where we've annotated what the pixels are into a neural net. And eventually over time, it can start recognizing those things without human assistance. So it's effectively neural net driven pixel pattern recognition. But when I describe to people what that is, especially journalists, they invariably go, oh, that sounds like facial recognition. And, and I'm like, well, you know, we, we do recognize faces, but facial recognition on a technical basis is like looking at the distance between the eyes, eyes to point of nose. And, and on a technical basis, it's a completely different discipline to what we do. Uh, but to a lay person reading a, a generalized article, uh, facial recognition gets you quite close to what we do, and it's, it's approximately correct. Uh, so that's how we've been sort of stuck with facial recognition for cows over the years. Like, it's not exactly what we do, but it's close enough. So fair, fine. Gotcha. And uh, Daniel, can you uh, sort of take us on the, on like how you actually use this technology to create the final images? Yeah, exactly. I, I'll tell you in a second, but I, I'd just like to add that uh, it's quite funny that like, I think this is how people 
people can relate to this topic. If, if you call it face recognition, then okay, yeah, well, face is what an individual has. And so therefore this is something that has to be recognized. Whereas of course, in terms of um, technology and, uh, and in the farm environment, you could easily have, a, easily have another uh, recognition uh, software that would, um, which I actually, I think some uh, working robots actually have uh, like a virtual image of the other. And this could be also uh, replaced um, by the face uh, or the, the face could be replaced with that. Um, yeah, I think uh, it's quite easy to follow on, 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 on David's idea because I really like uh, how he emphasized measurement and the use of cameras for the measure as, as a measurement device. Because um, I, of course, at first I wanted to understand how uh, this technology works uh, because of my uh, theoretical background. I'm quite interested in, in how really things are uh, before I come up with some artistic reflection on the topic. Um, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say that I completely understood how it works. I read uh, tons of articles about neural networks and uh, of course the weightable studies executed on a way smaller level than uh, how Kentus is operating, I guess. But I, at least I understood the principles. But what I found interesting is that there's not much to see. Uh, it seems like, to me, my impression was that um, the technology works as a black box. There's not much in between visuals. Uh, it's not something that you can actually see. As far as I understood, and I think this is also what David told when, when, we, when we had a chat last November, is that in many cases, they themselves are creating visuals just for like kind of to just to illustrate their processes, but it's not that it's there as an intermittent uh, um, visual of, of an actual process. So I thought, okay, well, this is not going to work. If I want to come up with, uh, I don't know, ground truth uh, layers and things like that, I can do it, but it's not, not gonna get any close. And so I wanted to, I wanted to reflect on this kind of virtualization and gamification of, of, the, of the agriculture industry. And I was looking for a tool that somehow reflects this virtualized um, uh, relationship to, to animals and also how it becomes, how, how an animal becomes data, let's say. Um, and I wanted to kind of create a kind of virtual herd. Uh, in my previous project, uh, I worked with chickens and, and in, in that case, I, I, I photographed the individual chickens. And I, of course I had this, uh, image in my mind, so I thought, okay, how, how could I create a virtual herd of cows? So I wanted to, to scan them, and first I, wanted, uh, I started to, to experiment with the uh, Scanac, um, which is this e Xbox uh, console, um, and I wanted to, to use that. Uh, but it turned out that, as David uh, told, uh, um, these technologies are quite sensitive to environment, and so when I went there to the actual field, it was not even a, a closed shed, but a, um, an open field in the burst sunlight. And I wanted to scan a cow, nothing happened. So I was like, okay, what, what other options would be to, to 3D scan a cow? And then I came across uh, photogrammetry, uh, which I find really interesting, especially because it's, um, it was originally developed for cartographic purposes. Uh, so it's actually, a measurement tool uh, in principle and not a means of artistic expression. And I think this very much fits the idea of my project. Um, and I wanted to play around with that. And also it's a, it's a process in which you, you take two dimensional images of a three, three dimensional uh, object or uh, subject as a cow. And then uh, based on uh, calculations of, of matching uh, points, it, it kind of extracts three-dimensional information of these two-dimensional images. Um, and so the input is two-dimensional images, and then there's a, a cloud image, which, which basically just gives you the, the matching points at first. And then it creates a so-called dense cloud image where it adds some more information based on the principal uh, dots that you had. And then these dots are being, uh, connected and that's, uh, that's how you get the, the wireframe. So like a three dimensional polygon. Uh, but I really like this in between steps. Uh, maybe I can, I can share my screen and, and show some of that uh, just, to, just to give you an idea. So um, this is the, the, the mesh that you have uh, when this is my very first scan back from 2019. Um, this is from different directions. Um, 
Uh, but I think it's not visible, right? Because now uh, Zoom says that sharing is paused. Uh, we can see the wire mesh of the, the lilac wire mesh of the cow. Ah, okay, but then I think I have to do this so that you can see again, right? Now we can see the portrait of the cow, Manon, I think her name is. Okay, and then we, we have that. This is the, the dense cloud image. So I really like this uh, way of representation because I think it reflects with this kind of virtuality um, that it's it's a cloud of data, let's say. So you can, and, and, and I had this idea that these kind of softwares are basically dealing with animals and in a way, uh, in, in a manner similar to this 300 degree, 60, uh, 360 degree customer view as you have a full information package of, of your client, let's say, uh, or uh, the cow here. And also, I think it has a, some sort of um, painterly quality to it, uh, which I also find quite important because um, because it, it brings back this kind of nostalgia uh, or this romanticized image um, of what we had uh, of these cows uh, from several hundred years ago. I think, uh, for example, this image of the, the Durham ox, uh, like there are all these images from the late uh, 17, early 18th century. Um, and we've somehow, I think, we, I can say that we relate to it in a nostalgic manner, but already in that time, it was nostalgic and, and over romanticized uh, because it was very much the beginning, uh, close to the agriculture and, and industrial revolution of the introduction of, uh, of selective breeding. And it was like, it was just a lie, let's say, uh, or to, to put it simply. Um, but I also like how, like, I think this kind of cartography um, or, or mapping that is photogrammetry used for is also an important connection point uh, um, in, in uh, Hans Ulrich Orb's uh, book about mapping. I think it's called Mapping It Out. In the preface, they say that uh, mapping at some point always involves violence. And it reminds me of, of this exploitation of, of uh, um, uh, during the, the colonization. Um, and I think with colonization and mapping, you always on the other hand, has to have to get this kind of romanticized view or exercise, uh, like how you turn it into something exotic, let's say. Um, and I think that's somehow connected in this uh, in this topic. Um, yeah, so I, that's that's how I ended up using this uh, this this technology. Um, and what what else was there? Uh, and just to be clear, Daniel, our technical team absolutely loved uh, your your artwork when they first saw it. They they were delighted with it. I'm really happy to hear that because it was uh, for me it was a big big step to say, okay, I'm not going to exactly show what is going on, but I'm going to to use the technology to give an impression of of what is going on. Um, and it's it's yeah, it's it's still quite new. Um, but it's it's nice to hear that it's relatable uh, to you too, uh, and it's not just nonsense uh, artistic uh, bullshit. Let's say. <laughs> well, no, it's a, what it, the main thing that spoke to them on it was. Oh, you can see the signal emerging from the noise, <laughs> and a lot oh. of what their work is trying to oh, yeah. do that. <laughs> but also, I think it's very much connected, and and I realized that this is what I wanted to say. That I think. Um, one of like it's it's quite a principal idea that nature is always culturally mediated, uh, but in this case, culture is very much replaceable with technology, and photography, for example, played a very important role in how we perceive, understand, uh, and survey nature. And I like the idea that we have these two-dimensional representations, but we extract three-dimensional data out of it. So we always have something in between, and there's something where there's a spot when when the reality is, 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 is lost and it becomes a pure representation, but still we extract a kind of virtual reality out of it, like a, a representation and we make sense to it. Uh, and I think this kind of distance uh, in between what is being represented and what is understand, our, our understanding is quite an important step. And uh, that also makes it make sense for me in this case to, to use this technology. Wonderful, thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's really interesting that you say about uh, nature being culturally mediated because we do think of nature as something that just happens organically, but it's uh, not. And even our interpretation over the years of nature has been 
done by people and the books have been written by people and even uh, evolution um, of the animal, especially farm animals has been influenced by people. And I suppose now it's going to be influenced by uh, technology, potentially. Um, like you're looking at, um, I suppose there's this kind of disengagement possibly happening between the farmer and the animal. Um, and I, I don't think we're looking at like a future of fully automated farms. I don't, I think, um, I don't think that's true, but I, I, I just wonder what like this technology means um, or what it does, sorry, what it means already for the evolution of the animal, having less human interaction and other animal interaction. And uh, maybe it's not like a physical evolution, but behavioral evolution. And is the evolution of the cow now determined by algorithms, for example? Um, yeah. yeah, so so <laughs> just to, to speak a bit on that, so to, to, to start on first principles, like I always like to point out to people that when people talk about this form of agriculture being more natural than this form of agriculture, there is nothing natural about agriculture. Agriculture is an artificial food chain created by humans for humans. And the, what we tend to call natural agriculture just means we've been farming that way for a couple of hundred years and, and we refer to that as natural. But really all of the plants we farm, all of the animals we farm, all of the ecosystems we farm, they bear close to zero resemblance to what a natural, pristine, untouched ecosystem would look like. And even what we call like old growth woodland, like those were ecosystems created by humans to provide things like mushrooms and wild boar. And if you're European anyway, uh, the Amazon's a whole different thing as well, where you basically had indigenous cultures encouraging different trees to grow in different places that we now refer to as a pristine natural jungle when it's not. Um, it's, it's very heavily influenced by humans. So where this comes back to sort of cows and technology, so cow humans, whether you like this or not, humans are the planet's, planet's apex predator. And to other animals, we look like predators. We've got forward facing eyes, we've got big canines. If a prey species herding herbivore like a cow sees us, they see a predator unless they've been socially conditioned that this predator will look after you, which is kind of what historical cow husbandry is. Um, and over time, we haven't just been selecting cows for being good meat producers or being good milk producers. We've been selecting them for their ability to not kill humans has also been a very important selection. Uh, I spent lots of time around African Cape Buffalo. Uh, they don't do very well in that regard. Uh, they very much want to kill you if they got half a chance. Um, so like the difference between a cow and a wild oryx, which is what they originally evolved from, and there's two kind of main cow strains, uh, Bos indicus and uh, Bos taurus. Uh, Bos indicus are basically like the ones you see in India and South America with the humps on their backs. And Bos taurus are what most people consider a normal, normal cow. Um, but uh, where, again, where it's going to in technology in terms of what we do. So I, I see it as less increasing the separation from us and cows because that's kind of already happened over the last 30 years where historically the people who looked after cows were people who grew up on dairy farms and they either would take over the family dairy farm or they'd go working for another dairy farm or beef farm or or whatever else what's happening increasingly today with urbanization is a farmer's child will go to university get a degree and then they'll be lost to the farm. And that sort of generational handed down animal husbandry techniques, we've kind of lost them as part of our urbanization process. And on the large scale farms, a lot of the people who work there often have no background historically in looking after animals and they're low paid hired laborers. And they're working on shifted schedules where they're giving a limited set of tasks and their ability to like understand an animal's body language the way someone who grew up on a dairy farm could do that's extremely restricted and when we look at technology being applied to modern agriculture today so modern agriculture today is principally based on green revolution principles which was our last big agricultural revolution where you'd basically norman borlaug worked out how to use mechanization chemical inputs 
to pump out your outputs. So we, we massively increased yields of everything, including livestock after the green revolution and the super abundance of food it gave us. But the downside consequence of the green revolution was we simplified our agricultural processes and that caused tremendous ecological harm by doing that. So instead of using crop rotation to manage fertility and uh, pest control, we started using chemical pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers. And the extended harm that that caused is crazy. And, and again, the, the average person doesn't seem to understand that livestock agriculture is generally bad for emissions and nitrate pollution, but it is dramatically better for general ecology, insects, uh, plant life, things like that, because you're not growing monocrops in sterile fields. And when you're trying to solve for the future of agriculture, you're like, okay, how do I take the good aspects of livestock agriculture in the sense that it's more ecologically friendly than broad acre tillage agriculture um, and mitigate against the more negative aspects of both tillage agriculture and livestock agriculture. So why we're doing what we do with Canthus, one is um, to normalize that relationship between the farmer and the cow again. So we're effectively teaching computers to interpret animal behavior in a fashion that a highly educated human would be. So if all your laborers don't know a lot about cows, but you have a computer system that can fill that information gap, that's kind of why we're doing what we're doing on, let's say, an animal behavioral basis. On a welfare, sustainability, and productivity basis, the reason we do it is, so there's this thing called the Pareto principle that most people know as the 80-20 rule. And when you start looking at macro level global agriculture, you start seeing this 80-20 rule with agriculture everywhere. And the example with dairy cows is you have 20% of the global dairy cows producing 80% of the global milk. And those 20% of dairy cows make the same approximate amount of emissions as the other 80% of global dairy cows. So to put that in hard numbers, uh, in the United States, there are 9 million dairy cows producing about 11,000 liters of milk per cow per year. There are 275 million dairy cows on planet Earth producing an average of 2,300 liters of milk per animal per year. And you could basically, if all cows produced at a level of efficiency as US dairy cows, you could reduce the global cow herd from 275 million cows to 69 million cows without losing a liter of milk. If you increase average productivity to 15 and a half thousand liters per cow, those 69 million cows can feed 10 billion people at the same level of consumption uh, that uh, are the same level of global dairy consumption today. So by using a technologies like ours that can benchmark what good productivity is, you can effectively take 200 million plus dairy cows off the planet uh, with all of the environmental gains that come along with that. Like there are 40 million dairy cows in India producing 1200 liters of milk per animal per year. They are creating just as much methane and just as much nitrate pollution as an American cow producing 11,000 liters. And most of the big problems in dairy and in tillage agriculture is not with the large scale producers, it's actually with the guys who are using the same amount of land or the same amount of animals and producing dramatically less food with that. So that's the, the sort of productivity and sustainability element of it. And then the welfare side of it is, so again, as I said before, cows are prey species herding herbivores that have a disproportionate stress response because they're a prey animal. So when a cow is stressed, it doesn't eat, it doesn't drink, uh, it doesn't produce milk, and farmers are financially incentivized to make their cows as comfortable as possible because of that. And what we hope to do long term with the technology we have with Canthus is if we have our system monitoring all the animals and monitoring, so we do a 24 hour time budget. Uh, for every pen that tells you how much time the cows are spending feeding, drinking, lying down, circulating, all of the things that cows do. 
And if cows are expressing negative behavior, like say the cows are only lying down six hours per day, that means you've got serious comfort problems. There aren't enough beds. Maybe you're overstocked. Maybe it's too hot. Maybe the environment just isn't suitable for the cows at all. Um, but either way, we can identify, hey, you've got a major cow comfort problem. You're losing a huge amount of milk. That's causing less efficient sustainability as well as welfare issues. Please go and fix that. So over time, and like this may not happen, but personally, I'd love to see a scenario where we have completely open barns where the cows can go whatever, go wherever they want, do whatever they want. They have their milking robots where they can be milked whenever they want to be milked. And it's only by having passive monitoring technology to make sure that nothing's going wrong with them, that they have enough food and water and that they're happy and all these sort of things that we can enable a dairy environment like that to happen. Um, and it's, it's kind of like, because there's, and it's kind of conflicting as well, because there's kind of, in many ways, you'd be better off having the cows out on pasture, but a cow out on pasture has a larger environmental footprint than a cow that is kept indoors. Today, the cow is far more stimulus and in many ways will be happier out on pasture, at least when it's warm and sunny, when it's wet and miserable, they prefer to be inside. Um, but finding a balance between what is a rich, stimulus rich indoor environment for a cow versus what are the trade-offs we're willing to make to the for, to allow the cows to be outdoors that's a big discussion we need to make and i always explain to everybody everything is a trade-off if you want the cows to be outside all the time we can do that but the cost of that is going to be large and if you're happy to pay the cost to do that then as an industry we're happy to do that and it's the same as crops like you know if you want the crops produced this way well then they're going to be way more expensive and if you're prepared to pay that price, then we're happy to do that. But knowing that increasing the global average of food is going to harm the poorest and most vulnerable people on the planet, you also have to consider that if you're saying, yeah, we want more expensive food because we prefer to farm like this. Like there's so many variables here. And, and I always try and frame sustainability as, like I, I wrote an article a while ago called the sustainability triangle of truth that like when you try and work out is something sustainable, you first got to establish, is it economically, environmentally, and socially sustainable? So an economic sustainability means, can the consumer afford to buy it? And does the farmer make enough money to live a good quality life while providing that food? Environmental sustainability can cover emissions. It can cover ecological sustainability. It can cover other concerns. Social sustainability, in my opinion, is a complete and utter mess because it's so subjective and variable and changes from year to year. So like when I'm sort of looking at long-term future sustainability, I try and focus on what's economic and environmentally sustainable, and then what is your best fit for social demands on top of that. So. Yeah, I think um, uh, also what you were saying about the, it, it's based, some of the questions are also being looked at by another artist in the show, in the exhibition, Hans van der Meer. He's also looking at the, he's looking from the perspective of the Dutch cow industry. Um, but also answering questions like the outdoor versus the indoor, for example. Um, I mean, there's a lot of projects, of course, concerned with sustainability at the moment. And it's a huge I'm sorry, just as we had a really funny one that happened about that in the Netherlands. So in the Netherlands, you get a grant if you can prove that your cows spend two hours outside per day. And so they used our cameras to establish when the cows were outside and when the cows were indoors and for the two for the two weeks we were there the cows chose not to go outdoors for the entire two weeks we were there because there was a heat wave on and we were like no one's going to believe this and we're like okay we can we actually need to make this a two-way camera where we need to show the cows had a clear unobstructed access to outside and uh, another camera demonstrating that they chose not to go out there because no, if we just tell them, look, we monitor and they didn't go out, no one's going to believe that. And it's again, it's like, it's the whole thing of predator versus prey species. When a predator sees a field outside with their predator eyes, eyes they see opportunity. When a prey species herding herbivore sees great wide open, they see potential threats and dangers. So it's it's like when you anthropomorphize your predator eyes onto a prey species herbivore, they look at the world totally differently to how we look at it. I suppose um, 
<laughs> yeah, so you got some bad luck with the weather. Um, but I, I want to, um, I'd love to talk more about the kind of practical um, uses of the technology that you went over really well. Um, but I just want to also um, ask uh, Daniel about kind of a more philosophical consideration um, of, the, of this technology and the project as well. Um, for example, the idea of agency and the agency of the cow, uh, or any farm animal, I suppose, in this case. Um, like, I feel with this technology, it's as if um, the farmer now has to react to the cow's demands, rather than the cow having to adapt its behavior to the farmer's or to our consumer demands, or at least not to the same extent. Um, and in Daniel, in your project, for example, you have um, these uh, salt licks, used salt licks from farms, and I kind of saw that as a representation of um, this idea of returning the agency to the cow as the technology is also doing. I wonder if maybe Daniel, you can kind of speak a little bit about that aspect as well. I'll do it in a second, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to go back to this topic about the cows leaving the, the, the shed or not. Uh, I had a very similar uh, experience when I, uh, when I photographed the chickens in my previous project. Uh, in which I had a, a, a barn packed full of chickens, 10,000 chickens and 2,000 cocks, and I thought that it, it's going to be really easy to photograph them because I can just, uh, like, casting will not be a, a problem, let's say. Uh, and then after two days, I realized that they don't take the opportunity to walk around the shed. They all have their little territories and they don't leave it. Uh, so, like, um, as David said, with your predator, um, you know, like you, with your human mind, you just thought, oh, okay, this is a hundred meters shed. It's really nice. We can take a walk, but they don't do that. Um, and I would also like to go back to this idea of nature uh, that has never, never been basically. Um, I really, um, I, I, I really like this idea of uh, when reading Timothy Morton that he says that basically agriculture was the first hyper object, and it like the, 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 the introduction of agriculture in general and settlement introduced the, the human nature or like the society or culture nature distinction at the first place. Uh, so this constituted the environment as we know it today, the notion of the environment, uh, environment outside of us that is very much uh, thought to be the principal problem with our lives or like at least from the post-humanist critical perspective, it's, uh, it's what constituted this um, human race or human species that is uh, placed above uh, other species and that uh, leads to exploitation and, and such. Um, yeah, but anyway, um, what I found really interesting about what you just said is this uh, kind of optimization that you can do more with less, let's say. Um, which I found like I very much have this feeling when I when I enter a barn and I walk along the uh, walk in between these cows that they are that they remind me of, of of locomotives I would say somehow I feel that they are magnificent beautiful giant creatures running on fossil fuel let's say um, and I from the very beginning I have this theory that the the, the, the history of, uh, of agriculture and um, basically the history of cows can be translated to the human history and, and the history of modern agriculture is very much a, a paradigmatic story of, of, uh, of modernism in general. Uh, uh, like you can see how, how basically cows had to be, um, like, uh, for example, Byung Chul Han says that uh, with the introduction of machines, there was a, immediately a need to somehow fit the, the, the body to the, to the needs of the machines. And for example, in that, uh, photography played a very important role. I'm going to share my screen again. Um, with uh, with uh, Edward Marbridge, uh, you had these locomotions, which, uh, which are then very much uh, connected to these images of, of like how to optimize work. And, uh, and then of course, Gilbert's uh, studies can lead to, to Taylorism, for example. And so like you, you see how, how this mediation of photography um, plays in this, in this need to somehow fit the body to the technology. And I think this is uh, again, very much what is going on in this revolution and, and evolution of the cow, that it, it has to be tra uh, 
compatible with technological in, in, uh, like the infrastructure around it and, the, and it has to meet the, the economic needs. And I think technology plays a very important role in that um, because uh, if, if we assess the, the behavior and the different qualities, aspects, productivity, uh, et cetera, of a cow through technological means, and then we uh, put this whole amount of a uh, huge amount of data into softwares that can then tell which uh, cow should be uh, made uh, with, 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 with which bull. Then you can somehow say that uh, that the evolution of the cow is driven by uh, algorithm and, uh, and and is perceived through technology, so that it and and it's driven to a um, a direction where it can serve technology the best in a way. Um, Daniel, can I can I actually just ask you a quick question on that? So just something that uh, has been playing in my mind for quite some time and based on some of the things you said there, how do you compare increased urbanization of humans and what increasingly urbanized humans look like to increased urbanization slash domestication of animals and how it changes animals. And like when, when you were talking about uh, using technology to select who mates with who, all I in an indoor environment for cows, all I could think of. So what's like Tinder in a in an urban environment for humans? Uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, well, um, basically, I think like this is what, what is very much fascinating for me that uh, like, uh, the way um, Fordism were, was uh, was first, uh, um, or, or yeah, this um, kind of manager capitalism was first uh, pioneered at Ford and and uh, and General Motors, as, as Shoshana Tsubov says, is very much similar to how uh, surveillance capitalism is pioneered at, uh, at at Google and Facebook, and I think this is basically exactly the same as as what is happening in the, in the non-human realm. Um, but I think it's also interesting to, to think about it because it very much reflects our uh, kind of double measurement system that we have different uh, concerns and, and, and we, 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 we raise different moral obligations uh, and, and questions when we uh, assess uh, our own lives uh, or we consider our own societies than when we think about animals. I, I always I always refer to humans as the special mammal for that exact same reason because we're a mammal just like all the others are, but we pretend that the rules that apply to all of these other mammals don't apply to us. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, exactly, but I think it's it's quite nice to see that it uh, that it does. Yeah. <laughs> and we just do the same, but we wrap it in a, in a different way, and we and we think that because we, uh, I don't know, because I applied to Tinder or uh, Facebook on my own, then it's a different thing than being a cow in a, in a, in a, in a robotic farm uh, and being milk. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we are very much uh, being sold and considered as packages of data. Um, so in that sense, the project is very much, uh, can be considered as a, uh, as, as a parable, let's say. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the point. Um, yeah, uh, recently I was, I was thinking about that a lot and it seems to be like that we have to give in to machines and uh, if we had the time I would be happy to, to discuss also this question of, um, because uh, when we previously had a conversation with David, he, he, he recommended me uh, Dawkins book about the selfish gene and then I was thinking about that a, a lot uh, as like if you consider the gene as an yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I think it must be getting commission. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's a great book for establishing certain incredibly important discussion points uh, we're having today. I, I know the selfish gene was written in like 1978 or something, but it just really crystallizes uh, a whole load of really important conversations we're having about humans today. So that I find myself recommending that book to quite a few people. Yeah, it's 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 really fantastic, and and like uh, I was thinking about that a lot, like. If we could, going back to, to, to genes and memes, I was wondering if we can consider technology, uh, like a capitalist, let's say, as a, um, as a very successful meme. Uh, in the well, of course, of course it is. Um, and I think it's quite nice how it's, I mean, you can call it nice or you can uh, call it bizarre, but it's very much intertwined with technology. Um, and I was wondering if technology could be 
considered like the technological infrastructure could be considered something as uh, as culture uh, so for like having genes in the biosphere and then having memes in the culture sphere or i don't know how is it in english in the hungarian translation dawkins puts it as the soup uh in which uh we're, um, we're floating i don't know what what is it in the original language uh, so i thought uh maybe it would be interesting to consider technology as the, the newest soup in which uh, there's some sort of replication and maybe it has different um, evolutional uh, principles. Um, anyway, I, I would be happy to, to touch back on that. But so I was thinking like, if, if I say that the cow is, a, is an animal broken to the algorithm, and then I also say that uh, my project can be considered as a, um, as a parable for uh, processes uh, reflected in, uh, and can be observed in human society, um, I was wondering where we could, where we could leak back, let's say, and uh, and how how we we could gain back our agency. Um, and actually, this is also what uh, what Dawkins says um, in, in in this uh, paragraph about the, the memes, that we have the chance and the ability to um, to quit this. Uh, um, how is it? I'm I'm gonna look for it. Just paradigm. Yeah, but it's like, yeah, we were built as gene machines and raised as meme machines, but we have the power to turn against our creators. We alone on this planet can revolt against the tyranny of the selfish gene. Uh, and I was like, okay, how, how is that possible? And if I go back to the project, yeah, um, I started to work on this project uh, when uh, the COVID came. So I started, um, with, uh, with an especially uh, a lot of uh, great amount of research, which I normally do uh, anyway, but now in this case, I didn't have the chance to, to go to the farms at the first place, because of course it would be, um, uh, it would uh, mean kind of, kind of a hygiene risk. So I came, a lot, came out with this huge construction of theory and, uh, and, 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 and it really, uh, everything fell into place and it was, I felt that it's solid, um, but then it was a very nice revelation when I when I first had the chance to really visit a farm, um, and then I saw these locomotives, as I put it, um, and so I thought, okay, well, it's, uh, of course, up until a certain level, you have all this theory, and it's really nice, but at the end of the day, there is this 600 kilogram, or maybe even more, uh, kind of rabbit, let's say, chewing on uh, plants and just uh, walking around. And I'm, I really, really love cows. And uh, and of course, I saw how they can resist the to to um, comply with the requirements of, of technology and how they can how they can do really crazy things to to mess up things on the farm. Um, it's also interesting that I, I read a, an article about how they cooperate and uh, it's also interesting to to raise the question of, of whether what they do there is work and, and how they cooperate and how they can kind of make allies as, as they would be uh, they would be in, in unions uh, of workers <laughs> um, but so yeah it was quite interesting to see how we want something and then they also want something and uh, and how we could give back the the agency of this animal broken to the algorithm and for me, the, the symbol of that became the, the soul click uh, because it's just beautiful. It's, it really is and it's organic. It fits your farm perfectly. Uh, but I also, I know that they are coming in, in cubic uh, shaped manufactured forms and they are given to the cows as cubes. But then how they lick it, it becomes uh, an organic shape again, uh, something that has quite artistic values and, and, and really, really in interesting forms. And for me, this became a symbol of how we or technology or we through technology can aim to parameterize and, 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 and kind of compress these living beings into um, a, a uniform uh, shape of let's say a cube and how they can interact with that and, and how they still have the chance to to be free and and how sub there there will always be a core which technology doesn't have access to um well yeah. it's the the whole wittgenstein thing uh the the most important values are the ones you can't measure uh so <laughs> yeah. um but but that's like I, I i'd agree massively with that and i mean internally we've spoken a lot about 
using technology to make a cow centric dairy like you're exactly correct how dairy farms are currently run today you you either are brought up on a dairy farm you go to college or you work on a dairy farm and then you apply your learned uh information and observations and heuristics you apply those to the cows and the cows react to you whereas that's not how it should be run at all you should be watching what the cows are doing and you should only act if the cows give you an indicator that they need you to respond to that. And I, and I thought the salt lick example was, was perfect because that's kind of like when you go to the big dairy barns we're installed with, like the largest dairy barn we're installed with has 10,000 cows on a single site in these in a, under a roof that is 1.68 kilometers long and it's got all these herringbone beds and, and all these things. And it's got really good cow comfort scores, but it's a classic example of, this is the system we apply to the cows based on our education, training, and knowledge. Whereas if you just observe the cows, um, so like that's the example of the cuboid or square salt lick is the environments they're currently living in. Um, if you just allow the cows free form and decide where they want to eat, where they want to drink, where they want to gather with their peers and where they want to be milked and all this sort of stuff, that is going to look wildly different than anything any human could ever imagine to create um and, and I, I like when i was looking at your salt like i was just thinking oh what is the dairy equivalent of that going to look like i mean that's going to be so cool when we can actually construct because the like in terms of space the cows aren't going to need much more space than we we currently already give them in dairy barns but how that space is used and deployed that's going to change hugely the more we learn about the uh, the secret lives of cows as i as i like to phrase it yeah. um it's a little bit like how uh, how these little paths are constructed in parks and there's this principle of like okay this is where the, the path should be and then people take the path they want <laughs> so you could um and there's this new new practice of just uh leaving everything clean grass for a year and see where people uh, walk and then they pave it uh which i, I, I like a lot um, I'd like to ask, uh, ask a question because I think we, we touched upon that, um, we touched on that on our previous conversation and uh, I would go back to this idea of locomotives and running on fossil fuel and optimizing. Um, and uh, I was wondering like, um, what could be the future of, of, of agriculture and like if I'm, uh, if I'm like, let's say, uh, because somehow I feel that um, we could really uh, save uh, the, uh, our planet with technology, but it's it's always, of course, um, we can also be quite skeptical about it. And, um, and and there is this idea of transhumanism that we can advance human uh, humankind uh, like up until the the point when it's not even human anymore. And I think that we are kind of already reaching the trans cow uh, in in this in this sense. Uh, but I was wondering that okay, but it's still a cow, uh, and it's uh, and I was wondering if if cellular agriculture, uh, in 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 your opinion, could could change that if uh, or if if it could really mean an alternative uh, for 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 um, precision farming, but still uh, ag agriculture in, in a traditional sense. Yeah, so I I think cell meat is incredibly exciting. Um, and th the reason it's most exciting, so in today's agriculture, we are entirely dependent on natural cycles. So how much sunlight, how much rain, winter to summer, all those sort of things. Going into a climate change scenario, if your entire global food production, so food production system is exposed to environmental variables, and because you focused in your entire global system on its ability to produce kilograms of food, ignoring most of the environmental impact of that production for a very long time, uh, we're really exposed to climate change when it comes to our global food production systems. And being able to produce food independent of those cycles is an extremely strong climate change mitigant. So it's exciting on that level. Obviously, on an animal welfare basis, it's also incredibly exciting. If you can get animal protein without any animals having to die, uh, that's a huge win. 
Now, personally, how I see things going, uh, first of all, today you can put 700 grams of cellulose into a cow and get a kilogram of milk out of that animal. So taking a waste product like cellulose and converting it into a complete protein that is one of the best things a lactose tolerant human can put into their bodies, uh, like that's phenomenal. And the cell-based meat is decades away from matching that level of efficiency with that level of waste upcycling. So my whole thing is in the far enough future, so say 2050, 2060, time horizon, presuming we haven't blown ourselves up or completely destroyed the planet at that point. Uh, I believe that the super premium animal protein will be animals that are living a pretty wild existence and are not kept on farms at all. And you will pay an incredibly high price premium for those things. And it will be a luxury good that reflects the environmental and ecological costs of providing that meat. I believe the vast, vast majority of humans will be eating cell-based meat for their animal proteins. Um, and it, it's just the efficiency of it, the fact that it can be used as a waste upcycling process. Um, it, it's just tremendously exciting technology. But today it's massively overhyped and it's a very low quality product that is very expensive and more than likely has a far higher like the, the marketing stuff that is coming out of the cell-based meat companies at the moment is frankly embarrassing from a ecological impact perspective. Uh, I went through a white paper that was released by one of them recently, and they basically stopped their environmental impact assessment uh, up until the point they got delivered corn glucose as the growth medium for their cell-based uh, product. So you basically had, they ignored all of the emissions associated with growing the corn and turning it into corn glucose, and then tried to say it was more environmentally efficient than uh, milk. And I, I just read the paper and was just like, okay, this probably has twice the environmental impact of high production dairy today. Uh, so again, massively overhyped today, will probably be affordable in maybe five or 10 years. We'll probably never get the nutritional profile of like a wild animal, um, but it will be very close to the quality you'd get from a intensive farm produced animal in maybe 20 or 30 years, I would say. So it's kind of like incredibly exciting technology, definitely part of our farming future for all sorts of really good reasons. Um, but currently massively overhyped and far, far away from being suitable on a nutritional level and suitable on an environmental level and scalability level and economic level, uh, still a ways away from that. I see. Thanks. And I can give you, a, as a quick rant on the plant burgers, the plant burgers are almost entirely irrelevant in the grand scheme of things because we don't produce cows to make burgers. Burgers are a byproduct. If the entire world ate plant burgers and stopped eating cow burgers, all that would give us was more expensive dog food uh, or higher quality dog food, depending on what you look at it. And whenever anyone asks me uh, what's the right thing to do if you can choose a plant burger or a beef burger, I always tell them, uh, if you can eat a plant burger or a beef burger, the correct thing to do for both the environment and your body is to eat neither of them. Uh, so, uh, They're usually uh, all these... Uh, like vegan products are also owned by the same companies that make the meat products. So well, day, well, you're the same. that's it. They're they're ultra processed. Uh, mm -hmm. I was about to use a rude word there. They're yeah. ultra processed foodstuffs. <laughs> um, I think just a couple of small, uh, not to, uh, comments from me. I suppose. Um, it's interesting you said the secret life of cows because I was thinking earlier that should have been the name of the talk. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, uh, it's actually a really good book called The Secret Lives of Cows. It's only like 150 pages long, but it's a, a lovely little insight as to some of the weird things cows get up to. Um, I'll put that on my list, thank you. Um, and the salt licks as well, I think if anybody can go and see the show in Rathfarnham, um, it'll be... The salt licks for me, even when I was unpacking them, when Daniel sent them in the post and I was arranging them, and I don't know why, but they made me feel very strangely emotional. <laughs> like I felt a really nice kind of connection to them. Um, I suppose because just knowing that they were shaped by uh, this wonderful animal. Um, I think 
Um, I, I know we can go on for a very long time and there is some questions that I wanted to ask that I didn't ask, but I'm just concerned about our times as well. Um, so one of the things that um, is personally important to me uh, is the, in my practice, is the relationship between art making and knowledge. And I'm interested in how artists can create work that is uh, rendered into, or that can be rendered into other practices that are not just art practices, like our daily life, social life, et cetera. Um, which is why like for the talks this year, we invited um, all these external professionals such as David. Um, so David, perhaps I can ask you how you feel about this. For example, how artists um, like in this case, Daniel are using in this case, your technology to approach the subjects uh, we discuss from more abstract and creative and philosophical perspective. And that's, uh, that's not to say that, that what you do is not creative or that you don't have philosophical concerns because um, I think you do absolutely. Um, and you must, I think, in your line of work as well. Um, but I suppose I'm asking your opinion um, on the artist's role within science and life and the creation of knowledge and so on. So my a bit like when Daniel reached out for me, reached out to me in like we got a cold email to our web page and I was like, oh, this is interesting. And I Googled Daniel and I saw the previous work he'd done on the poultry broilers. And it's like, there's, again, if you work in agriculture, you know this. If you don't work in agriculture, you generally don't. There's pretty much one set of genes that is almost all of the 20 billion broilers on the planet or whatever. And it, it's incredibly homogenous and incredibly fragile. Like nature loves diversity. And when I looked at that exhibition and I, I saw what Daniel did with like sort of that relatively like basic data point and, and all the art he created from it, I was like, whoa, what will this guy do if we expose him to all of our stuff? And what cool stuff is he gonna think of that? Because again, we're very focused on what's the problem? What solution do we apply to that? And can we scale that in a profitable fashion that it enables to be a tool? And as you say, while there's creativity there, you're constrained by economic needs in terms of like, if you told me I never had to make money, all of the crazy stuff uh, that I would do, like it, it would be a very different company if we never had to make money. Um, so, so getting exposed and, and then meeting Daniel and talking him through it, like he just having conversations about he, how he was interpreting what we were doing and his ideas and like his assumptions of how the technology did or did not work. That really got me thinking a, about a lot of different things. So I, I, and, and the reason I was sort of proactive in engaging in this was simply because I think there's tremendous value from artists applying their viewpoints to technology like ours and seeing where that leads them. Um, and it, it always just opens up interesting philosophical things, opens up like all sorts of interesting discussion points. So personally, I think it's incredibly high value. And I think it's something that any company should support. An artist gets inspired by what you do, uh, you know, encourage that artist, embrace that artist. You will end up benefiting as a company from having done that because they're going to bring such a different viewpoint to, to how you would look at things. That's lovely. <laughs> that's really nice. Um, yeah, that's a really nice way of looking at it, I think. Um, I suppose I also see um, artist's role as kind of like mediating these kind of works to the public. Um, and Daniel, how, how do you see your role um, within this as an artist, as a creative? Yeah, um, well, I don't know what, which hat I should put on. Uh, I also work for, uh, I, I have a share of slightly similar story with, uh, with David, because I also worked outside of what I really wanted to do for five years. I worked in uh, film production, uh, which uh, introduced me to this uh, new liberal system of capitalism uh, and, uh, and made me sensitive to its language and, um, and it really influenced how, how I approach my subjects and what I, what I chose actually as my subject. Um, but uh, during this time I didn't have access to art uh, as, as much as I wanted. But when I did, I always had this feeling, uh, I just want to reflect on this notion of creativity that uh, I think art and science are very similar in a way, um, and I uh, I appreciate when when it's not placed one above. Um, 
speaking about creativity. Uh, I think scientists have to be very creative and you can also just do your homework as an artist. And um, some uh, scientists doing their homeworks don't, don't ask us to have a glass of wine and just take a look at their papers. Uh, and it's not a social event that they publish something. Uh, and I think this is something that we should keep in mind. Um, but I can, I would even call that, I would even say sometimes that for me, art is very much similar to doing science, um, except for two principles uh, or like very similar to what David said about his uh, running the company. Um, we are, I think we are engaging in quite similar um, activities, but uh, first of all, I don't, uh, I don't want to, I don't uh, have the, the aim and, and, um, and need, uh, or I couldn't even have to make money. <laughs> uh, and I don't have to be right as a scientist in the a, in a, in a traditional sense. And this makes me way more free that I don't have to be profitable at the first place and I don't have to be right in a logical way. Or, um, or it's, it's, not, it's something that can never be fully uh, unfold. Um, but I think, so, uh, and this changes, of course, the whole game. Uh, we are, I think as an artist, I'm also working on making sense and, and to the word and, and trying to make me come up with solutions, uh, even if on a personal level to uh, challenges uh, I'm facing or challenges I think I'm facing personally or I'm facing as a human being living in, on this planet. Um, but I think like what is, becoming more and more important for me uh, is that I used to, to approach this on a very cognitive intellectual level and then try to, to translate it into something uh, more open and, and, uh, and visual. And I think uh, for me, in, in, in during this, the creation of this project, and this goes back again to the, um, to the salt leaks, what became very much important is that you cannot change life with with reason, and I think we are very much living in this tradition of, of reason and rationality, and it seems that it it just didn't help us that much. Uh, it, uh, it it didn't change the world, as Rosie Pardotti pointed out. There are still people who have believe who believe in flat Earth. Um, it's so yeah, uh, but emotion and and connection and and relationality instead of rationality will change our words, and I think. For me as an artist, that's the most important principle um, to, to translate or, or to, to convey what, I'm, what I feel, think, and, and, and what I've seen um, in an approachable way that creates relations. And this relation can actually change uh, maybe people's perception and, uh, and, and show them something in a different way. That's actually a really good point because I, I find myself saying quite often that ones and zeros don't win hearts and minds. And if you think you're going to convince with someone with logic, then you clearly haven't tried to convince a lot of people who disagree with you before. <laughs> and to, to have like people who have artistic flair, who can position things in a new way, present it in a new way, um, that can be incredibly useful in winning hearts and minds. Um, so it's, it's, again, that's just something I, I would just be like, yeah, that's, that's exactly why, why that's important. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that's um, a really lovely way to um, wrap it up. Um, so thank you both. Um, can I just ask one last question just for the crack? Uh, David, can I ask you if you can share something very interesting that you discovered about cows that we may not expect having watched them 24-7? <laughs> uh so like i mean some of the like one of my main things is is just when you're watching cows like the degree of complex social behavior that they have that we go we're, we're simply oblivious to like one of the big things we found out is how cows behave when humans are in the barn is completely different to how cows behave when there are no humans in the barn and you know when you think about it it goes back to that predator prey thing and it makes complete sense why would you display your natural behavior when the planet's apex predator is walking down the middle of the aisle? Um, so that, for me, one of the most, both, like, I like it, but at the same time, I don't like it, is that the degree to which the behavior changes when no humans are around. That, that was, the, I wasn't expecting it to be as, as significant as it was. And it both delighted me and saddened me <laughs> that they have such differentiated behavior when there's uh, one of us are around. 
sneaky cows. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're much more clever than they get credit for. Oh, I, I think they're a wonderful animal. They're one of my favorite animals. And um, I actually, in the festival, they somehow ended up as the protagonist of the festival. Um, and at first I was like, oh, it's accidental. But then I realized that it was like some subconscious probably projecting from me. <laughs> well, I, 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 was... I had a, I had a con we sent a photographer up, a professional photographer to, to go and take a load of uh, product shots for us in, in a barn up in, in Northern Ireland. And when I got the first photos back, I, I had to call him up and I and I said, I'm I'm really sorry. And I know this is probably going to sound kind of weird, but you really captured the soulful eyes of the cows in your photograph. And he said, No, it's not weird at all. I know exactly what you're talking about. I've taken photos of lots of cows, and there's just a way their eye, their big eyes just look at you. And yeah, he he just really captured that well. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Daniel, if there's anything that we, um, I mean, there is a lot, of course, that we didn't mention and didn't talk about, just because this is a huge, huge topic. But if there is anything that you wanted to add before, um, I, I really wanted to show a photo if I can, if I can find it just in a second, because I, yeah. I really fell in love with the uh, with cows. I mean, I loved them before, but I, I love how curious they are, and I, um, I, I took a really funny photo of them. Uh, I just want to see if I can if I can find it quickly because uh, that's so uh, expressive of them. I think. Um, just a second, because I think Actually, more on the cows and artists. There is a wonderful Irish filmmaker um, artist, Mika van Michelin. She's Dutch, but she uh, lives here. Um, she's done a lot of work with the Kerry cow, um, who is, um, if I'm not mistaken, is like the closest to the ancient cow that we have uh, at the moment um, and it's really beautiful work as well she does these um I suppose they're like portraits they're films but they're portraits of this cow they're really really beautiful if you get a chance to see it um okay uh, anyway I think I, I'm not going to be able to okay, okay this image is not well you have to send it to us by email later we can <laughs> we can edit this into the talk afterwards <laughs> here <Hi>. it is <laughs> Um, thanks so much, uh, David and uh, Daniel. Um, yeah, I just uh, really, really, really grateful for both of your time. And I know that we went over the time that I said. Um, so I'm really super appreciative. Um, and if you get a chance to go to Rathfarnham and catch Daniel's work, that would be great. It's on until the 2nd of August. And um, you can find out more about different upcoming talks uh, and exhibitions at 2021.footireland.org. Um, and yeah, I suppose I'll say goodbye now and uh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Julia. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you.